everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming today. And the idea is that we really want to keep it focused on just the business elements of interior design. We do other events that are focused on um, suppliers and more the design and creative element, but this is what it really felt like there was a, a gap around, is the business element. So for our first event, we wanted to do something that really resonated with us as a company as well. And one of the things Anika and I have always been really surprised about is actually the lack of kind of recognition of the entrepreneurial nature of the design industry, and specifically interior designers. Hi everyone, I'm Mel, I'm the co-founder of Smith & Sinclair. Um, my company's been going for three years, and we are the founders of Edible Cocktails. Um, in case you're wondering what that is, they're basically giant fruit pastels that retain half a shot in them, but not like your chocolate liqueurs. It's actually a patented recipe where the pastille itself is incorporated with the alcohol. So pretty potent and forging the way for sort of this adult play through consumable products. Um, we've recently launched our first experience retail concession in John and Lewis. We've grown from just me and my business partner who's a chef to 12 full time this year and are planning our international growth. Hi, my name's Aaron. I'm Annika and Bloom and Wild. We're an online flower company. We want to make it a joy to send and receive flowers um, anywhere you want to send them. Um, we started a bit more than four years ago and um, we're offering flowers every nationwide across the UK. We're now also in France, Germany and Ireland as well. And there are 55 of us on our team now, which feels like a huge number of people. And um, yeah, we're trying to be the flower company that everybody loves uh, in the UK and beyond. Hello everyone. Um, I thought I'd actually just start with a thank you. I'd like to thank Bee for inviting me here. <laughs> it's a real pleasure. And then, Laura, really, it's a, it's a real pleasure. And honestly, I have to thank all of you as well. What an amazing turnout. There's loads of people here on a Wednesday afternoon. So, honestly, I feel very privileged to be sat here in front of you. Um, my name's Tim um, Mutton, and yes, it is a part of the sheep. And my company is called Black Sheep. And I am the founder, and also known as the head shepherd. Um, <laughs> For my sins, uh, I'm an interior designer. I changed to interior design, so I'm a, I'm a designer. Uh, my father still doesn't know what that is. Um, and Black Sheep is a, is a design agency, and we specialize in uh, food and beverage, and what I call sort of food and beverage branded experiences. Uh, I started the business pretty much just myself and my business partner 15 years ago, and we've grown to uh, 35, 30, 35 designers now. We did get up to 45, but I didn't enjoy it as much, but you probably ask me some questions about that later. Uh, and we're just based about a mile up the road. So, thanks again. Hello, I'm Anika, um, and I'm the founder of ePorter, and I'm not going to tell you what ePorter does, because I think all of you basically know what ePorter does. So, thank you all for coming. Um, in terms of, um, just a quick recap on our journey, Bee's already mentioned, we started the business about three years ago, um, with me and my co-founder, who's a very good friend of mine from university. Um, we launched two years ago, and as Bee's mentioned, we're a 30 person office now, and with wonderful members like all of you, and also now with presence in about 85 different countries worldwide. And so, uh, really thankful to all of you for being here today. Um, one of the things that we would love at the end of the day is a lot of feedback in terms of um, what you think has worked at the event, what you'd like to do more of, what you'd like less of, and we'll definitely um, take that into consideration for all the events that we do going forward. But as I said, super, super glad that everyone's here today. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I guess to explain as well, we really wanted to for this panel and um, have people who weren't all just from the design, well, interior design companies themselves as well. Um, the reason for that being so we can make some parallels between really just entrepreneurship across different industries. But all of these companies are very design-led. Obviously, Bloom and Wild is really important to them, and Mal's company. You did the VNA party as well, the design um, week party as well. So they're all kind of very embedded in the design community. Um, so I know there's a real mixture of people in the room. A lot of you have started your own businesses already. A lot of people started uh, working in different studios. Probably here to just get a wider understanding of the whole kind of management of the studio, or maybe think about setting up your own practice at some point. Um, so we start at the beginning and really talk about kind of what started you off on the journey, and when did you actually decide to go from kind of having an idea in your head to starting your company, and how did that kind of come together? Um, so Smith and Sinclair started as a complete accident. Um, my background was in theatre and music, and I became quite obsessed with the idea of dating nights. This is sort of pre-Tinder and digital connections, and um, I wanted to bring 
what play means to children and how much they connect over that and lose their ambitions to an adult world. So I took over a bar in East London and put blankets on the floor and loads of board games everywhere and invited a group of sort of 25 to 30 year olds and then I had a 55 plus group as well, not at the same time, different, <laughs> different times. Um, and I was like, I just sort of expected once you opened the doors that people would just know what to do, but actually as you get older you formed really bad habits around what social inhibitions are and people would come down and immediately get a drink and then not know what to do and didn't want to sit on the floor because they didn't want to spill their drink and they didn't want to actually touch anyone because it's considered inappropriate in the UK to like have very casual physical contact. Um, so instead, not that I'm like promoting like human rights, <laughs> that's like what I mean, it's not the time for that. Um, what I do mean is like, it's only such a change. It's not like that. Um, but to get people in the mood of just like loosening up a bit, um, we needed something that was like a signal to play. It was something that we recognize and products are the quickest way, you know, as, you know, beyond technology, beyond anything, products are what people connect with um, sensorially. So we gave people pick and mix bags as they came into the bar and then we had jars going down the stairs with names saying gin and tonic, whiskey sours, berry daiquiris and people filled their bags and we didn't have to tell them to do it. They knew it really instinctively that that's what they were supposed to do and then they didn't go straight to the bar because they had their hands full and actually as they ate it they realised that actually that was a kick which kind of, you recognise alcohol as, you know, a relaxant, which it is naturally, so it, the, the fact that you could taste it meant that they could play, that was it. So they loosened up and whilst the bar wasn't happy with the decline in sales, um, <laughs> it totally worked and then people would take them on their way out and then take them into work the next day and we kept getting all these calls of like, oh, you know, so-and-so brought in your whiskey pastels and we work for m and and we'd like to order them for our Valentine client. Um, so we were there like cooking up in my kitchen, making the odd bits here and there and I had a friend who had a, um, ran the markets in Berwick Street and said, you know, we've got a free space if you want to do it for Christmas. So, you know, I was luckily freelance, so I could uh, be flexible with my work and my business partner was a chef who was an agency at the time, so as well, we could both take like, three weeks to do this and literally slept for three hours. We'd wake up at seven, we had to get our markets all up and running. No one wants to buy alcoholic sweets between 7 a.m. and about 1 p.m. and then 1 p.m. it starts getting really heavy. Um, but we sold them, we made 3,000 pounds, we built a website, and got an order for 20,000, which I thought was a sick joke. Mm -hmm. um, but it was actually in Bible Live, which is a big um, alcohol trade show, kind of like conferences you're talking about. And they used it as a marketing activation, which meant that the business was formed as, as demand called for it. Um, we suddenly had to make 20,000 sweets, and I lived in North London, and I'm thrifty, so I contacted my local synagogue and was like, are you using your kitchen? And they were like, no, and I was like, can I use your kitchen? And they were like, sure. Um, so we drove around pretty badass in my eye go from synagogue to synagogue in North London using people's kitchens until we made 20,000 sweets and then hired all the 18 year olds who were like local to the synagogue to pack them. We had like a really solid sweatshop going on. Um, but it, what it meant was we never took a financial risk to start a business or to just, you know, what a mistake a lot of people seem to make is, especially in food because it's quite a low um, barrier to entry because if you have a good idea you can pretty much sell it in quite quickly, um, is that people think they've got the million dollar idea and they go and they produce, you know, 100,000 jars of peanut butter and go to Sainsbury's and they're like, I've got 100,000 jars of peanut butter and Sainsbury's like, I don't want your peanut butter and you're stuck with all that stock. So what we did was we only made to order for the first two and a half years um, and it's only in the last year we've launched into John Lewis and House of Fraser across the UK that we had to um, take that plunge into really campaign planning, um, build a significant amount of stock um, to make sure that it wasn't just, you know, the odd stores in here and there, it's a demand of about 1.2 million sweets. So, we're no longer in the kitchen. Um, but we've had to, you know, build the resources to carry that demand, so build the team and build the production site and upscale manufacturing, and you wouldn't believe what I know about encapsulated malic acid in bulk purchasing. Um, and with that, we rebranded. So as B said, our brand is fundamentally how we educate consumers. No one knows what an edible cocktail is, so we have to show them, and we do that through the aesthetic. We did a huge campaign around them. Um, God, I feel like I've been talking forever. Um, can someone just like tell me to stop talking when it gets boring? Um, but yeah, we're very brand-led. We'll come back to that. You go. Um, that's that's such a great example of a really organic kind of um, growth, I guess. Just finding out by accident that one of the elements of that event had real legs, and then. Uh, allowing it to grow organically and, like you said, not having to take financial risk, which is 
a real blessing. Um, was that, I guess, probably quite different in your experience, Aaron, um, running a tech company? Yeah, a little bit different. So uh, I guess our start was similar. Um, we had a couple of insights as well. I started with a partner. Um, we were both uh, fans of a company called Grace, which makes snack boxes that they send to you through your letterbox. And uh, we both used to get these uh, at our old jobs and thought it was really cool. And both of us uh, have had frustrating experiences sending flowers, um, going to Google, typing in flower delivery, not in or wherever. Um, and not really recognising any of the companies, not being very excited about any of the options out there. And I guess we wondered whether we could um, combine these two insights and send flowers through people's letterboxes. You know, like Melanie started by renting space by the hour in New Covent Garden Flower Market and um, using our savings to buy flowers from flower traders at the market who um, sure ripped us off because um, we didn't know what we were talking about. We were, Sort of, sort of learning what different flower types were and stumbled across insights were really helpful. So many of you have probably bought a Christmas tree before and had a big net put around it by the person that sells it to you so that you can put it in your car and take it home. And we saw micro versions of these nets on the floor of the market and literally picked a couple up and realized that we could put them around heads of flowers and that then flowers be protected and compressed to um, travel in a less box shaped box. And, and we would sort of pack boxes ourselves and take them to the post office and negotiate with post offices over whether um, you know, they were like the right size to go on a cheap tariff and stuff like that. And, and I guess you know, we then diverged and, and did raise some money from angel investors and um, you know, have not been profitable since then, but have really tried to, um, to grow and just um, listen to customer feedback and use that to make the proposition better and better. And, um, as soon as we could afford it, with having raised the money, we invested in, um, at the time, one um, and 12 um, people who are software developers for us. And that's um, that's one of the ways that we're really differentiated. We've built our own, um, not only website, but also iPhone and Android apps. And then um, all of the technology behind the scenes that people use for um, packing the flowers and forecasting and you know grows and stuff like that, um, shipping companies. And so um, I, I didn't know any about this when, anything about this when I started, but learning about technology and um, how you can use that to make a business work more scalably has been, um, yeah, really interesting. So it sounds again like you, you actually started with more of a specific idea about the problem that you were trying to solve then, um, but it still sounds like a happy accident had a significant part to play um, in what your business evolved to become. Um, and what about you, Anika, was that, um, I'm I feel like a you can say about this. Me, no, but, but I think uh, the interesting question: How much do you think um, is necessary to plan before you decide to start a business, or is it actually something that um, you know can just be a happy accident if you just continue to kind of drive forward in a direction? It's a good question. Um, I feel like I feel like there's that there's an element of planning involved in both, even though both have been and have the accident in terms of how they manifest themselves. And, and when we when we look back and say how did we start e Porter, we also we didn't actually start with financial investment to begin with. We started with me and my friend Simon um, working out of his well my kitchen and his extension of his bedroom and um, writing the website and um, figuring out exactly what it is that the community of people that we were working with really wanted. And then one of the things that I did to really validate um, if the idea had legs or didn't have legs was to pre-sell the, the, the software that we were offering. So uh, B knows a story by Cold Called Harris. I hope they're not here today because we know them quite well now. But Cold Called them and said, hey, we're doing this thing. We're here to make your life easier in terms of streamlining sourcing for you. Is that something that you're interested in doing? And they said, yeah, come in, let's have a conversation. Let's be with all of our senior leadership team and then you know, let's see what it is that you have to offer. And so we started building the product really around helping them solve their sourcing needs, um, sourcing from lots of different furniture retailers around the world. So I think that you know, looking at is there, is there an element of planning involved? Of course there's an element of planning involved when you're starting a business, but actually you can't really plan too much because you've got to move with where things take you and you've obviously done that 
super, super well now in terms of figuring out, oh, this, this idea has legs, let's build more, let's only um, make to order so that we don't have to invest in too much stock. Ari, I think with, you know, you and I are probably a little bit more similar in that it's hard to do that with a technology business because it takes a long time and people to actually build the software, but still the agility that you need in terms of figuring out is this something that does have legs or doesn't have legs, and if it doesn't, changing it is something that I think everyone needs to do. And what do you think, Tim, from the perspective of the interior design studio? What what was your background, and when did you actually decide to launch your own practice? And what did it? What was the kind of turning point there for you to decide to set it up? Uh, it was a couple of things. Obviously, you know, I'm a creative person, so I don't plan. <laughs> so I never, I never had a business plan at all. Um, that, that obviously has changed, um, but I completely fell into it. I, I did. Um, I fell into it at a period in my. I would say my design journey where I just got pissed off with the industry. Um, you know, I graduated, I'd work, always worked within sort of fairly, you know, decent sized practices. And I just got to a point where, I think it was where my boss gave me a review and I'd worked really, really hard. Um, and that was the expectation of the industry. It's slightly changed a little bit, but I worked seriously hard. I remember having a review and he said, look, you've done amazing, you know, you've done, I don't know how many cameras, bars or restaurants I've designed at that point. And he says, and you've done so well, and I'm going to give you a thousand pounds pay rise. And I thought, really? Great. And I remember I went to the car park. Uh, we had an office and had a car park. I remember going down into the car park to pick up my bike, cycle home in the rain. And I looked across, and my boss had a brand new Range Rover with a personalised number plate. I think the number plate even had cash written on it. <laughs> And I just thought, what am I doing? And I remember thinking, anyway, I was having trouble anyway. I, I think generally I'm a sort of individual that, you know, am I employable, really? Um, you know, and I, I, I just thought, this is it, I'm going I'm to change. I, I need to get out. Um, and, and part of the issues I had anyway working within that practice was everything was quite formulaic. Um, I felt that actually I could pick up a pen and I knew what it was going to look like even before I started designing because there was a palette. It was a process. And I think sometimes in the design industry, that's the wrong way to go. You know, I, I truly believe that actually everything should be bespoke. It, they should have some sort of strategic commercial vision around what you're doing. Um, and also at the time, um, I remember that same boss, I can't mention his name, please don't look me up on LinkedIn. Or anything like that. I've been in terrible trouble. Um, I remember we went to Hackersan, the opening of Hackersan, it was in a basement around the back of Top Court Road, which at that time um, smelled more of piss than it does anything else, than anywhere else in London. And I remember going in there and he said to me, This will never work. Really? And I could see this idea around brands happening, you know. Um, and I've always loved restaurants, and I just thought at that time, I need to break away. I had no idea what I was going to do. In fact, I wanted to go to California to work in San Francisco, and I had a job lined up, but 9-11 happened. And 9-11 happened, which meant I couldn't get my green card to leave this country and go work in America, which is really what I wanted to do. I wanted to sort of extend myself as a designer and kind of work there. And it didn't, it didn't work. And I was then going, oh, what am I going to do? Um, at this point, I sold my car and I sold my house. I don't know what made me do it, but I just did it. And I remember standing on Wilson Green Tube Station thinking, what am I going to do? And I felt I couldn't go back from working for somebody else within the design industry. I just made my mind up. Um, and it was more of a gut reaction, you know, even at that time. I've learned to use my head now, because obviously <laughs> I have to look after 30 people and pay their wages. But it was a, like, a proper gut reaction. And I just remember thought, I'm going to start my own business. And I thought, yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. Okay. But like, how'd you do it? Like, when I was at university, nobody says to me, or anybody, they still don't do it, I don't know. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of you, a lot younger than me, but I think that there is a problem around, you know, entrepreneurship, and I do struggle with that word, it's in, in, in all honesty, but particularly in this country, which has got a history of it, people don't sort of talk to you about it, they don't talk to you about how to start up. And I actually remember ringing the design council, and I said, look, I'm a young designer. Um, well, I really, really wasn't that young, I was kind of hit. 30. No, actually, really young. I'd pit, I'd pit 30 actually. Um, so I was having a bit of a crisis anyway. Um, not as bad as the crisis I had when I hit four. But, um, I remember bringing them up and I said, Look, I want to start up. And they said, oh, That's a good idea. Um, yeah, but if you want to do it, you've got to be a member and it's going to cost you two grand. And I thought, Two grand? I mean, 
I was brought up in Scotland anyway, and I'm quite tight. I thought I'm not spending two grand. So in the end, I spent that two grand on two computers and one telephone. And that's how I started my business. In a live work unit in Kingsland Road. And that is the beauty of the design industry. You can start with nothing. You just need a computer now. You don't even need a space, to be honest with you, because you've got lovely places like uh, WeWork. I never had them when I started. Um, and that's how I kicked off. Um, and I was very naive, honestly. But I think that was a bit of a plus. I remember going to speak to my uncle because he ran his own business for a bit and I had to sort of register the company and do all that kind of boring stuff which I really struggled with, you know, find an accountant. I didn't even know really what an accountant was or what an accountant. And to be honest with you, for the first six years, I didn't know what an accountant does. I still don't know. I still made a lot of money. And that's honestly how I started. Um, and I waited for the phone to ring and it didn't. <laughs> You know, but the beauty of back then, I'd sold everything I had, so I was living off that. And so I wasn't really that bothered, to be honest with you. And there was a little bit of a laziness to me. Um, but in the end, I thought, I can't continue like this. Um, and it was a friend of a friend who often offered us to do a job. And it all sort of started from there. But really, it only started with just basically a lot of angst and a lot of anger and just falling into it. Um, yeah, it sounds like that's a fairly repetitive theme. So I just wanted to do something better than I felt the industry was offering. And I, and I still firmly sort of believe in that now. Yeah. That's a really nice perspective to add as basically just a pure emotional kind of drive. I was, to start yeah, your I was like really I should do that. pissed off, you know. Mm. Um, just disclaimer, I can't recommend just selling your house and all your stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a personalised number plate now, though? No, I don't. <laughs> I think the thing is, um, I, think it, I think one of the qualities, is, I mean, it's just me, though, I, th I think that there's two different sides, particularly to interior design, you know. The, I, I was working with someone who was sort of really highly recognised in the industry and beyond. And there was a certain level of arrogance that came with that. And because of that, the culture within, within our studio, it wasn't really conducive to kind of creativity and learning and supporting one another. Um, and I, maybe it's a generation thing, but I just, I couldn't deal with it. I, I, I ended up sort of like feeling that like every day I walked to the studio, there was a regime of fear. Like, if you go for lunch, why are you eating? What are you doing? You know, it was constant, constant, constant. And it was the same with kind of like constantly having to present yourself and, and present the work you've done. So it, it wasn't really free flow in terms of kind of learning that you, you could get within this industry. So. Yeah, I, I think I just wanted to do something where I wasn't like that. Um, it took me a while actually to kind of get rid of that, to be honest with you, because it's kind of a behavioural thing. But I, I think that actually it's best to be humble. Um, and, I, and I try and I know, do that. So I, I don't spend money on personalised number plates, don't you? Question directly. No. It feels that there is, I've got yeah. a big yacht. I <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I don't, honestly, I don't. I, you know. One day, one day. <laughs> Feels like there is then, even though everyone has kind of come from quite a different place, there's a common thread of when you kick off, just throwing yourself into it and kind of seeing what happens, what comes back, and then being responsive to that. Um, what I'm really interested in is when did you, when do you feel as a kind of turning point to when you realise like you know you get your first job or you know you figure out how you're going to package the flowers and you figure out you're going to sell the sweets and you're like okay this is a business that I'm doing now because I think this is actually the stage that a lot of our members are in, they've been running a business for maybe a year, um, a few years as well, but kind of actually like, yeah, this is working, but I want to take it to the next stage and develop it. Um, what are the milestones that maybe we'll, we'll start on the other end this time, that you feel were like the, the time when you realised it was going places and you maybe had to put more of a plan together and take it to the next stage? Yeah, um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, we've got like milestones that we've celebrated. Um, I'm trying to think back of milestones that meant I had more conviction. Um, with the first people using the platform. I mean, the, it's always been, what's great about our community is that we just get a lot of feedback, and so and we get good feedback and bad feedback, and obviously we work with the bad feedback over time, and so it's probably seeing the way that people use the platform. Um, I mean, our first order date, we all nearly jumped into a river near our office. Um, we got really excited. Ellie's there laughing because she remembers she was there. <laughs> Um, uh, then, I don't know, I mean, we're always thinking about how we can do things better. So I'm thinking, when did we, million orders, probably that day? That day was probably like, yeah, we've got a, we've got a good business here. This is doing well. 
probably there. But in terms of like, I think that I'm probably slightly unusual in that we we did, you know, we threw ourselves into it completely from the outset, iterated on what we wanted to do, and then we raised money, and then we we just keep throwing ourselves into everything that we do. And so there's an aspect of. You know, I don't think that our team could have more conviction at any stage, or I could have had more conviction at any stage. And I think that's actually one point maybe to mention, that you do, you need to kind of be a bit blind in terms of thinking, yeah, I'm just going to go for it and it's going to work, and just keep going at it until it basically does work. And so for me, it was never a case of, oh, this turning point means I'm like, yes, let's go for it. It's more, let's just make it work. And if we put smart minds, um, a great attitude, a great culture in terms of the team into it, it, it will work and that's basically how we thought about it. Um, Tim? Um, uh, you know, I've, I used to measure it kind of like on the work we were doing, projects. And, um, you know, I, I started off where the only work we could get was in doing clubs and bars. And that's how we kind of really started. In fact, my first real proper job was actually designing the Cougar Club in Mayfair. And it was um, a wonderful experience, you know, because it was, it was proper hands on. And, and I was very lucky because the club did extremely well. It's still there today, actually, even as a nightclub, which is brilliant. And then I thought, well, I've done clubs, I've done bars, I might do restaurants. But then I sort of knocked on the door of restaurateurs or restaurant groups, and they're saying, well, you can't design restaurants because you only design clubs. <laughs> I was like, right, okay. And then you just keep knocking, and you keep knocking, and eventually got one, I got to work with Jane Oliver. And I thought, oh, brilliant, I've worked with Jane Oliver, that's amazing, so now I can do some hotels. And then um, I knocked on the doors of the hotels, and they said, well, you only do restaurants, can't do hotels. <laughs> so then I was like, okay. And then actually, you just keep going like that as a kind of owner, you know, you just, you know, and, and, and even like today, I'm thinking, because I'm, you know, I'm obviously done the hotels, and I'm thinking, well, what's next, you know, for Black Sheep? And it's always been this sort of, idea that um, I view in terms of our progress, you know, the work we're doing and now, it'd be a vineyard, I don't really want to do a vineyard, but actually I want to do the architecture, I want to do the labels on the, on the bottles, you know, I want to do the uniforms, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's my next, that's my next kind of leap, you know, that's that thing, I have this kind of mental need to kind of keep moving the work up, and I don't think that's ever, that's never sort of left me, um, I think that's my leap, I think. And then, but the, there was other things used to get in the way, I used to sort of like, as an owner, I used to think, oh, there's not enough bums on seats in this in the studio. I need loads of people to, to make me feel really successful. And so I'd get then sidetracked. I'm easily distracted. Um, and then I'd sort of think like that. And then I'd like, at the end, sit in my accountant's office really depressed because he said, you haven't made it. You basically paid a lot of people for salaries. <laughs> um, and so what you do is you end up kind of learning from those things. And I, I, I think that actually you don't really move to the next level um, in terms of your business, either because you know people are going. We're not far from the city here. They go, well, you know, what about your turnover? You know, what about your profit and all that kind of stuff? And that is important. Um, but I've always kept the work very central to kind of how well we're doing. Um, it's shifted for me now. I'll be honest with you. Um, it's not just trying to get the balance between being profitable and that sort of thing. But for me, it's the people that's the most important element. Um, it's not so much now how many bums on seats I've got, it's actually the progression of the designers that work for Black Sheep. And it's actually seeing how they develop. And what I have learned, actually, the most important thing is also, is myself. And um, me knowing myself more, uh, and actually being a good example, um, hopefully then for everybody within Black Sheep, to then become the next leaders of tomorrow. So that's the sort of shift for me. Um, there are other times as well, and maybe I'll talk about it, and we can talk about it later, about when things get really tough, like really hard, you have to take some really difficult decisions and meet the needs in terms of, you know, things that can really take you under. And I think it's those moments that then really shifted your business. And there was one particular time that it happened for me where I forced myself to go to business school. Because um, I knew nothing about business. I had, I had my business for about eight years, but I couldn't really see that we, we were doing anything different. And I wasn't very happy. In fact, I was really miserable. Um, and it was for a number of reasons. One is because I was about to have a young family, and I, and I couldn't afford, I physically couldn't afford things. Uh, and I couldn't, I was living you know, hand to mouth, month to month. And I felt I couldn't live like that any longer. So I forced myself into business school. And it actually taught me some of the fundamentals. A lot of things are really in front of you here, you know. Uh, but actually, it's very nice to then work with people who give you a great perspective. Um, and what happened was, it allowed me to focus. 
and it allowed me to specialise. And so, as a designer, I was trying to do everything for everyone. And I went back and I suddenly realised that I only enjoy everything connected to food and drink. And I like the culture, I love everything to do with hospitality, and I decided that's all I'm going to do. And it took me a bit of time, but I saw threefold, fivefold growth in my business since then. And it's kind of continued to a point where I'm like content with it. Um, where now I spend more time sort of concentrating back on people and respect to them. But that's a little bit how I kind of measure things. That's actually a really interesting point to bring into it, um, is that kind of specialism as the team grows, and I know that's something we've experienced as a team as well. So for you, Aaron, um, what was your kind of turning point in the, in the business, and did that play a part in it? Was there a time when suddenly you had to go from basically doing everything as the founder to um, divvying up roles more? Yeah, my, uh, my boss at my old job, uh, told me that the most important thing um, if I was going to start a company was customer satisfaction and um, that if uh, people like what you do then they're recommended to their friends and I remember that and uh, you know, I was the only customer service agent we did meet up responsibilities and I was in charge of customer service and a couple other things and my partner's in charge of like, getting hold of the flowers and making sure they arrived um, and we'd get um, Every time somebody placed an order, our um, computer system would send me and Ben, my business partner, a confirmation email. And we'd get one or two of these a day and we'd look at each other and sort of like, they said like, oh, Bob Jones, how do like, you know him? Because I don't. And I remember the first, um, the first person, her, her name was Lisa, and we looked at each other and neither of us knew Lisa. And I both of us like writing an email to Lisa immediately to ask her how she'd heard of Blue and Wild. And um, it turned out that one of her colleagues, um, who was one of her friends, had told her about it because um, they tried it themselves and liked it. And um, yeah, that really stuck with me. And I thought, you know, we didn't have any budget, but we, um, we cared really deeply about the experience that every customer has. And that stuck with us now. And, you know, I still do customer service um, every month. Um, Sometimes a couple of times a month I do emails and calls and people don't know that I'm a founder, but um, I learn a lot from talking to our customers. So I find all sorts of like micro things that I think we should be doing better and um, it's that constant listening and trying to improve that sticks with you. And we have had to focus as a company and you can't have everybody do everything. And actually for some people that's, uh, that's made really good people, that's made Bloom and Wild not the right place for them because they want to do a bit of everything and it's harder to do a bit of everything when they're people so um, I think you have to accept that you will um, lose people and they'll remain friends of the company but there are people who uh, for whom a 10 person company is right and there are different people for whom a 50 person company is right and maybe one day we'll be, we'll be bigger still and we'll be right for um, other people. I think the other thing just to build on this focus point a bit is um, focus around what you do um, We've got investors and customers who ask us all sorts of things. You know, can you do um, funerals? Like, can you ship flowers to like New Zealand? And like, you know, I'll pay like expedited shipping, and I, I don't mind how much it costs. I just want them to get there, or you know, whatever else. And, and actually, knowing when to say no, and just allowing yourself to say yes for a really small number of things that are that you're saying because you're confident you can do them really well, rather because. You know, somebody asked, and so uh, you sort of feel that like you have to say yes to everything. Uh, it's really important. We've uh, we considered uh, going into other product categories other than flowers a lot. We've got customers that uh, use our app and website to send flower gifts, and they say, you know, what do you do? Like boxes of chocolates or all sorts of other things. And you know, we've said yes with a couple of things. We do uh, mini Christmas trees through the letterbox, and we'll do those for our third year. And uh, now that, that is, so we have like expanded a little bit, but we are, um, it's really important for us to stay close to our core of what we know we're good at and what people um, associate uh, us with and not try and do everything. So maybe it's like, you know, you just want to do stuff related to food and drink, you just want to do stuff related to like flowers and horticulture and uh, get as good at that as we can. Yeah. That's a good point, and also maybe, actually, um, conversely, it was helpful for you as a company to be focused just on restaurants for an amount of time as well, so you get to build up a reputation there. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's like, it's like the whole master of you know, every, either universe, actually, you know, particularly within design. Um, the, 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 there's many others that kind of 
do a, do a lot. And if you're working between the genres, you know, we were so doing residential, commercial, retail. I mean, I honestly, with the residential, I really super struggled. I mean, imagine looking at me, trying to do residential, jeez. <laughs> You know, and the thing is, I realised as well, actually, the big thing for me is I, I actually tried all those things. And, then, um, and it, it just came down to the emotion that I had and the attachment that I had with it. And what I realised was maybe the you know, majority of those things, I never got asked back. You know, I never got through the door to get a drink. Um, you know, doing the clubs was great. You know, I got like, I, get, I never get paid much, but I got a ton of cocktails. <laughs> but I got to get the owner, got to know the owners really, really well. And, and, and then suddenly, yeah, you know, when I, when I just made that decision, it was such a turning point. And I would say, you know, even with Black Sheep now, we just get deeper and deeper and deeper inside of that kind of, that world, you know. I wouldn't have imagined even finishing this year. We've done a cooking school in, um, in South Korea for the Hyundai card business. I mean, like, wow, I mean, I never would have thought that was possible. And we did everything, like, we did the uniforms, we did all the packaging, you know, and that was always, I guess, my vision, um, because I always wanted to break out just doing interior design. I remember when I first met you, you'd just been in the desert for, like, three days, yeah. studying yeah. cinema in Morocco. Well, I think, yeah, I think it's a big part of, of you know, if, if you do something you enjoy, you're always going to get more out of it than just it being work. You know, and I'm, I'm kind of fortunate. I mean, I, obviously, sometimes, you know, I try and get the most out of it because I did get this client who's in Kuwait who's got cinemas. And he asked us to get involved with this um, cinema brand. And I said, yeah, I'd love to uh, come out and meet with you. And I understand, like, camping in the desert is because he's, he's from a nomadic tribe. And I said, that's a big deal, right? And he goes, yeah. And I said, no, I'd, I'd love to go camping if it's possible. <laughs> and he's like, no problem. And two days around the desert. You know, I was like, it's unbelievable. I mean, you know, I'm not always just thinking about my Instagram account, but <laughs> it does help. It's important in the restaurant industry <laughs> after all. Yeah, completely. Um, but yeah. So, and Mel, what about you? Did you kind of have a moment where you started realizing you needed to focus on one area, or are you still kind of having to do a little bit of everything in the company? Um, no, I could yell really loud. Um, I think I'm a bit behind, probably a bit behind these guys in the sense that I say we're probably going through our biggest milestone period now. We, um, for the first year, it was like people just kept buying it, and it seemed like so much money. I mean, what you know, there's, there's all money's. Look, I'm Jewish, so all money's good money. Um, but like, it was, it was, it just seemed so. It was just kept coming, and we didn't really have to make any decisions. And then we got kind of into year two, and we've been very reactive to that point. Like Harvey Nichols were like, "Do you want to start doing gift boxes?" We saw it at this trade show, and we'd like to start stocking them. So we spent five hundred pounds working with these Welsh design students, creating a really, you know, beautiful box at the time, and got it into shops. And then we kind of got two years in, and none of us really loved it because we kind of convinced ourselves okay we're, we're alcohol innovators that's what we do and um i had a friend who works she runs a semiotics agency which i don't expect anyone to know what semiotics are but they're um it's basically the signals it's the signals we recognize for everything it's everything from colors that you associate with different products to um the disabled sign like it's everything and um, we sat with her and her company because they wanted to transition into design and, and hadn't done that yet. And they were like, so what are you? And we're like, we are 100% alcohol innovators. And they were like, and what does that mean for like the next product? What does that mean for your business? How are you going to grow? Are you going to bring on mixologists? Is that how you're going to grow? And we were like, eh, yeah. And they were like, well, do you like drinks? And I don't really drink. And my business partner's a chef and he likes beer and wine. And, and we were both like, oh, I guess. No, um, and that was really hard to stomach because we'd had, you know, to that point we'd had sort of three hundred thousand pound in revenue of a product that none of us really understood what its purpose was or why we were doing it or how it would grow. We had to take a really big step back and kind of go, you know, what's going to make us love this for the next ten years and what's going to make other people love it because. Like Tim said, like people are the most important thing. If you, it's like going to school. The only reason you like to go to school is because you want to see your friends. The only like, reason you like going to work is because you're getting to do something fun and be around people you really like. And you know, everyone in the office will probably say that I'm incredibly distracting and they wish I was there less. But um, you know, I, I love the team. And if they didn't love what they were doing, they wouldn't be there. And um, we'd take a step back and be like, actually, I used to be a musician and I, and I love theatre and I used to be, you know, freelance producer of Secret Cinema and brands like that. And um, 
you know, that, that we wanted to bring that back. And I was like, well, you know, how does, we had this whole personification of people. So I was like, how does Jenny and Hull experience something fun weekly? Because there's not, no offense to anyone that's from Hull, um, but there's not like a huge amount going on. And um, it's like, that's really, that really sucks that they can't, that like, you know, that people don't get that accessibility outside of capital cities and cultural cities. And, um, and actually they consume, they get the stuff from Tesco online or they go into stores and they get the necessities. But actually the reason why retail shopping is dropped down so much is because you get the same experience if you buy a t-shirt online or if you buy it in stores. If anything, it's just more hassle in stores you have to deal with people. Um, and, and so what we've done is we've kind of taken what Amina loves doing, which is creating completely new products and have decided we're a business which stands for innovation. Innovation through products specifically. So, you know, why wouldn't you want to eat a cocktail if you can drink it? And why wouldn't you want to lick a perfume off someone's neck? Like, how horrible is it when you, like, lick someone's neck? And you've all done it. I don't know, like, why you haven't <laughs> licked a neck here. Um, but how many times have you licked a neck and been like, oh, you, I can taste your perfume? Like, why is the perfume edible? You know, let's start flipping things that we recognize and take for granted on their heads. And let's have fun doing it. And let's put those moments into really cool experiences in store. Like my, you know, the dream for the business now is like, if you could go into a Waitrose and you walk down an aisle and you have 17 different smells as you walk down that aisle and every product is tactile or engaging or changes color when you hold it because it's thermoreactive. Now like, that's fucking cool. And my whole team are totally invested in that idea. And you know, our office, if you come for a meeting, we're based in, I mean, we're based in Millwall Football Club and it's like horribly dangerous and pretty bleak. Um, but in the office, um, you sit on our desks and you touch the desk and the whole desk will change color because we've put them in reactive materials over. We're basically like a giant playground. Um, and, that, and, and that's been a really big milestone is having these people in, in the office who, who just like are so creative and they're coming up with ideas that I love. And for so long, it was just me sort of pushing ideas against my business partner, who's just a really um, practical person. So I'd be like, let's do this. And he's like, I'm not gonna make 22 types of sherbet. And I'd be like, okay, okay, let's do this. And, and you know, we've recently done um, a gallery in Hoxton, which is a, we're calling it a flavor gallery. So it's a gallery where all the art is consumable. So you can touch it and it reacts, you can smell it, you can scratch it, you can play with it, one of the walls vibrates. Um, is actually sponsored by a sex brand. I think that's really cool. Um, but when we did the press invites, my marketing manager came in and she was like, I had a really good idea. We've got these boxes downstairs. And, I, and again, I'm really like thrifty. And she was like, we've got these boxes that we've carried with us for two years. And I'm like, because I hate throwing things away that have value. So we've got these random boxes that used to fit our pastels and they're a different size. And she was like, I, you can fit one of our new individually wrapped pastels in it. And I want to do a little card that says, flip me and blow me and put a little straw in there and you flip the card over and blow with the straw and it was heat reactive it revealed the invite date and location on the other side of the card and i was just like now this is fun like that makes business really enjoyable when actually people are so invested that they're wowing you with ideas and they're creating ways for you to make money that you never thought you could make so that you can get more people who are invested and actually like that's why i look so tired <laughs> Um, that's amazing. I think that sounds like a big period of reflection really recently and actually it's a, it's a nice point um, that does come up a lot as well with our community is that moment of kind of making sure that you're actually doing something that you really enjoy otherwise the hard work just maybe isn't actually worth it. Um, <laughs> um, so just before we open it up to questions from the audience, um, just have one last question about something that's just come up that's kind of relevant to the, the next stage of business as well, which is company culture. And you've all spoken about the importance of people and your teams. Um, and that's something, when you're starting to kind of build a team um, or growing a team, how do you make sure that you have the culture in your company that's going to be productive and also be enjoyable? Um, Aaron? It's something that we've focused a lot on recently. I found that uh, so late summer that the energy in our office felt really low. It was really depressing. We'd, uh, we'd worked like so hard on that. I've always felt the culture had been really good and I kind of took it for granted. And, and then all of a sudden it wasn't there, you know, and it's sort of like everyone was like going and getting their lunch by themselves and sitting and eating it by their desk and like looking glum and like not saying hello to each other. And it was uh, made me really sad. And I realized that I had underinvested in being there, you know, I was also like trying to be a good dad. We have uh, we had our first child in June, so I was trying to balance like and being around with them. 
my wife and daughter with them being at work, and so I hadn't really like, stayed at drinks with the team, and I was like trying to leave on time so they could have bath time every day. Um, and, you know, I started to like clear my calendar from doing stuff that I thought I had to do. It was spending time getting coffee with people, going for a drink with one or two people at a time, just really trying to get under the skin of what was missing. It turned out that there were like three or four themes, a couple of people who like started to like say things in the wrong way, a couple of decisions we made that weren't quite right. And, um, and then like I, as I um, sort of understood these issues and like started to regain the trust of people who'd been with us for a long time um, about uh, things that they weren't happy about that were making the atmosphere flat, I tried to enlist them to sort of like help me get things back to where they were and uh, you know, kind of, I, I promised them that I'd listen to their feedback and we'd try and change things and then I asked them to help kind of re-energize those around them and their friends and that was, uh, that was sort of my top priority for the whole month of uh, like late September, early October and I think it really worked and now we've also just moved office which has really helped and now the culture is better than ever, we, uh, we've had a couple of exciting milestones uh, a company recently and, and we've really celebrated them and, and everyone's been in a great mood but I think uh, it's very easy to take your culture for granted and assume that everybody uh, yeah is just going to carry on loving working there because they love working there now and actually it's something that you need to like invest in all the time and so uh, it can be easy to let that be the thing that drops out of your busy schedule when you've got meetings and deadlines and targets and stuff like that but you can't do uh, and what about you, Nikon? Yeah, I, someone said to me the other day, culture eat strategy for breakfast every day. And I think actually that really stuck with me because um, like we have one life and you know, you want to enjoy it and coming into work every day is something that everyone, well, nearly everyone has to do and we spend more time at work than we do at home and so why have a rotten culture where no one enjoys actually being there? And so one of the things that I always try and do is figure out, you know, I always have a pulse on, are people happy or are people not happy? And if people aren't happy, I think actually Alan's right, you've got to be around to figure that out, that's number one. And number two is, if people aren't, just ask them why and figure out what's going on and be super, super open um, with the team in terms of figuring out if there is something wrong and if there is something wrong, really communicating that back. And I think that we've been lucky because the team's great. I know a lot of you will know the team and um, everyone's fantastic and everyone's you know, really invested in what we do, which carries itself. But now, you know, even yesterday, we're having a discussion around hiring 10 more people. And, um, you know, culture, well, 25 to 35, when's culture gonna break? Maybe it's 45, maybe it's 55, but something's gonna give, and we need to figure out what else we do to make sure that we continue on the trend that we do. So I was gonna be mean and ask Nicole, well, what do you think about our culture? But actually, I wouldn't do that, even though she would love it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think it's something that you just need to think about every single day, like actually every single day. And if you're not happy going into, even if it's a two person office or a four person office or a 10 person office or whatever it is, something's up. Because if you're not happy, no one else is going to be happy. And what about you, Tim? Is there anything you guys do in the office to maintain that culture? Um, we give away a lot of free alcohol. <laughs> they actually do. We used to actually be in the office of both them, and every Friday, everyone was obliterated. <laughs> it was yeah, maybe, maybe we'll go down the edible route, um, so we can start earlier. Um, I'll be honest with you, I learned, I learned even, even through that, um, we've just changed that. Um, to be honest with you, and you, you're right, you know, as you grow, your culture changes. Um, and it becomes much more challenging you know, as you grow, because it can become a bit diluted. And it's the same with money. You, you, you take one higher, one wrong higher, and your entire culture can just disappear overnight. Um, because it's a reflection of a bad decision you've made because of the wrong person coming into the business. Because everybody just sort of goes, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? Um, particularly, you know, if you're saying, Really, you know, they're working for the best agency in, in London. You know, you've got to be able to sort of transmit that through every piece of decision making that you, that you have. But at the same time, you know, even the head shepherd is human, and we, we kind of make mistakes. But you're right. You know, you know, we design great places, and I'm always talking to owners about ensuring that you get the atmosphere and the vibe right. And it's the same within your own organisation. Um, I think there's a need 
the, the, the most important for me is you've got to constantly be aware of what your purpose is and communicating that as well. Um, I think it's the same in regards to behaviour. Back on the giving away free alcohol, we actually decided now we're not going to do it, and primarily because actually um, it, it didn't lend to more the sociability that we felt it would have within the studio. Um, people just took it for granted. So um, we took it, took it away, and there's a lot of mumblings about it, because they thought, <laughs> oh God, they're so tired. Look at them taking our booze away on Friday afternoon. Um, but actually, it kind of forced everybody to go to the pub. And then when they all came back in, they were like super, super, sort of, super sharing with regards to the sort of things that got on. I didn't get told everything. Um, I think a few people got together, and you know, it's all very nice. And you know, they, they managed to vent their frustrations. They probably spent a lot of time talking about, you know, my bad decisions, mm -hmm. um, or even just the nature of the work they're working on, or even their aspirations, um, or even actually the things that they're having trouble with, and all of which are actually really good and useful to us. Um, but also I learned as well, even from clients, I suddenly realised that actually it really matters um, who you have around you. And um, certainly for me, uh, I love being surrounded by talented people, and I love being surrounded by people that really care. Um, who are ambitious um, and um, who kind of really want to sort of, you know, prove themselves. Um, and I suddenly realised it was a client who said to me, he said, look, um, I'm, I'm really pleased, we've, we've really enjoyed the final outcome, but the most important thing is that actually um, we really enjoyed the design journey. Uh, I thought, well, I took a step back from that and I thought, what does that actually mean, the design journey? Obviously, not just the process, of creativity right through to final delivery. For me, that's a bit of a given. It's a bit like any uh, you know, brand group coming to see me and say, look, we've got this brilliant idea. We're going to create a new restaurant brand, and it's all about fresh food. You go like, surely that in today's age, that should be a given. It's a bit like design. Design should be good design, and it should have you know, uh, a great outcome where it changes people's lives. But actually, with regards to that design, design journey, that was, the, that was the, for me, like, a different dimension. And what it meant was, actually, they'd really enjoyed working with the people associated with Black Shoe. And it was, you know, the ability for them to shine as individuals and for them to feel like, you know, nurtured and cared for. And so I have this thing around sort of, uh, I think it's called uh, psychological safety, you know, and I think that's really important that people get that. You know, it's the, it's the stuff beyond just doing the work that really matters and trying to get that culture right, particularly for us, that actually I know when somebody's not well or they've got a family member that's not well and actually they get that support within the company, you know. Definitely. Because it's something we hear a lot actually, it's such a relationship-based yeah, industry. Yeah, completely. I mean, it's like me. Uh, you know, I'm a creative person. It just happens that I've just fallen into running a business. When I'm really miserable, I'm not shining. And it's the same. I, I notice if, if things are not right within the company, if people are not enjoying the work they're doing, if they're not enjoying or having fun and designing, the final un outcome is shitty. And so it's my responsibility, not that it's a fun house, of course, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're obviously very focused on what we're doing, but um, you know, you, you've got to have that energy and passion, and you've got to be enjoying what you're doing. And it, it is back to where we've started this conversation. And trying to get that culture, you've constantly got to work on it, absolutely. So I'm just aware of time, we're actually coming to the end of the session. Um, so I just wanted to allow you know, one or two burning questions from the audience. But a lot of people ask about finding a co-founder or finding a partner to do something with, and I actually think that it's not always the right decision because um, a lot of the reasons why businesses aren't successful, actually the number one reason why businesses aren't successful, and there's a lot of data behind this, is conflict between two partners and them not being on the same page. So the way that I look at it is, depending on the sort of business that you're actually trying to start, what do you need in terms of skill sets to start that business? And so for me, it's a technology platform. I have a background in technology, but I'm not going to be the person who builds the product. Um, even though I can design the product. And so for me it was, I, I do need someone who is um, you know, heavily involved in that process. And so, so I guess number one thing is you don't necessarily need to have one. Um, 
it, it can sometimes not be beneficial to have one, but if your business needs one, then absolutely. And then in terms of finding the person, I guess I just, I got lucky because I looked at my network of friends, I ended up going to the pub with Simon, who's my co-founder, who obviously the whole team knows, and said, look, I'm looking for someone to do this with me. Do you know of anyone? And he said, oh, that sounds exciting. Maybe I'll do it. And then we both quit our jobs and started it. So I think that we got lucky, and well, I got lucky in the scope that he wanted to do it. Um, but I guess that the key thing that that we decided up front, and actually we did an exercise when we were first starting to say, okay, what are our cultural points that we care about? Because A, we're friends, we don't want to ruin that relationship. And B, we are very different in how we think and what we do, or well, we thought we were very different in how we think. So we wrote down a set of 10 things and said, these are the things that we care about, which are cultural ways in which we work together or in which we individually work. And thankfully, they were both aligned. Like in, to, a, to a very, very high extent, actually. And that made us think, actually, you know what? We can work together in this. So um, combination of luck and then also actually just being quite specific in terms of thinking, do you need someone? And if you do, make sure it's the right person. Otherwise, it's kind of make or break. Really good question. Actually, with that um, job, the very first job we did was, um, it was called Voyage. I don't know if anybody knows Voyage, but actually it was a retail project and it was for the Manzini family. And um, it was a friend of a friend who was just in PR, I was doing the PR for them. And this is a true story. So um, I'd never written a fee proposal ever. Um, I didn't realise I would get paid for something I love to do. And, and they said to me, look, we have this opportunity, the Manzillis. At that time, they were more well sold, they were more famous for actually slapping, slapping around celebrities. So they kicked my Naomi Campbell out of their store on King's Road and had a big bust up with the Madonna. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they, they actually said to us, look, nobody else wants to do this work. Because they've got <laughs> such a terrible reputation. <laughs> but I've always loved the challenge. And uh, th th this is honestly, they, they said, look, you, you probably won't get, they probably won't pay you. Um, it'll probably, it probably won't last. And uh, it'll probably damage your reputation even before you start. <laughs> uh, well, well, that's good enough. That's a good enough reason to do it. I've got nothing else to do. So we did it. And um, I was pretty fortunate. I, you know, I just poured everything into it. Um, and it was a huge, huge smash. It, was a, it took off. Um, I remember we, I think the budget was 200,000. I remember having a massive fight with Tatum and Zilli over you know, knocking out a slab and putting a staircase in that cost like 6,000. She couldn't un understand why it cost 6,000. And I saw the stock coming in when we, when we opened the store and a pair of jeans all ripped and shredded. Six grand, what? You know? Um, and what happened, happened from there is that a um, huge launch party, they spent more on the launch party than we did doing the fit out. Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate that a lot of people that came to the launch party um, recognized the design. I was hanging around. And, and it was from there that it, things kind of springboarded. It was just, I guess, the press from that um, and the sort of recognition that we've done it. And I ended up then going and doing the Cuckoo Club because somebody that represented the client uh, was at that launch party. And we ended up having a chat. Um, and you do have to kind of put yourself out there. Um, you know, I, I've always slightly struggled with, with doing that. Um, but you've got to constantly, you've got to constantly force yourself to kind of do that. And, and be around and try to speak to and meet as many people as possible.